Okay, I'm going to start this vlog off with a Sunday morning haul. Finished my cleave for the weekend and I went into Morrison's as normal Sunday morning. So let's start with more potatoes. These were 119 down to 89p. It tends to be a fairly standard price for potatoes. Not many um, discounted potatoes. Normally when you go there's only like two or three. So they're clearly selling quite well at the moment. Here's something I don't often get. Uh, Nairn's oat cakes. Uh, were a pound, now 50p. And I bought another one, a different one. This is the rough oat cakes. So I've got one of each variety. Uh, these are the Scottish rough oat cakes. Uh, all were a pound, also 50p. These are great because they will go into the stockpile for quite a while. Now the other thing I've got, which over the last couple of years, I think not so much last year, but the year before, you used to get loads of oat milk for free on the cashback apps. Uh, mostly minor figures, but you also had Milkology and a few others occasionally. And I managed to get an entire year's worth of milk supply because of all these freebies, because the oat milks have a long life on them. So I'd stack them all up and just use them in rotation when the dates came up. You, uh, at the moment, they're doing a 50% off on quite a few of these uh, minor figures, oat milks and barista milks and things. But um, when you look at how much milk you get for that, 75p, because they're £1.54 price, it's still better to go and buy the full price six pints of milk from Sainsbury's for whatever it is at the moment, 218 or something, dilute it down, make it into uh, 12 pints and then stick it in the freezer. Much easier. Anyway, so they had some on, they're quite close to their dates. Uh, yeah, these are today, but I'm going to sit them in the fridge, they'll be fine. And they're also a bit squashed, which I think probably doesn't help their full price. So these were £2. I've got two of this type, which are the Everyday Oat Light. These were £2, down to 20p each. So I've got two of those. I love oatmeal. If I had the money, I would just only drink oat milk. I love it. And then the other one was um, the the standard everyday oat. This is really squished. It has a, uh, a longer date on it. It's good till the 13th of June, but it's been squished. The packaging's not great. So it was £1.15 down to 15p. So I'm going to use that one first, maybe. The packaging still looks sealed because it's got like a plastic coating on it. So actually, I'm going to leave this. I'm going to put this in the fridge and then use the other ones. Um, so that whole lot came to £2.44. Um, and as usual, I will put all the, uh, the shelf price and the savings there. I've recently made a post about my food spend. Um, so keep an eye out for that. So just doing a little review, a four month review of what I've spent on food so far this year. I did my April food audit. So I was just checking through, making sure that what was on my spreadsheet matched up and then having a look at what was in the cupboards and deciding if anything really needed to be used. Um, but I've done another post, which is really about the amount of money I've spent and doing a comparison with last year because of like, food prices still going up, all that sort of thing. Um, so do keep an eye out for that post. That will be coming soon. And what have I got coming up this week? Uh, not an awful lot coming up. Oh, I sold three things on Vinted this week, which was, oh, this weekend, sorry, which was good. We had a little flurry of sales. So this last week, I think I've sold four or five things, which is nice. Clears a little bit of space, makes a few quid. And I've also just completed my next universal credit monthly income sheet, an outgoing sheet for my claim. Um, it looks weird this month because when I got to close to the end of the tax year, I wanted to make sure that I put in my maximum for the end of tax year. 
it doesn't even really work like that. I've worked out that in actual fact I can put in what I want into my pension. But I wanted to get to the end of the tax year having put in up to the limit that allows me to claim the 20% from the government. And it's 20% for me because I don't pay tax. So you get 20% on the first uh, 2,880. So I maxed that out. That brings me up to 3,600 with their um, with their contribution. And I've only had my pension account for four months because I took it out in January. So I'm trying to make up a little bit for lost time because I haven't. I'm 50 now and I have no pension. So I've been boosting it up with savings as I've got some of my fixed rate savings accounts where I've had money locked away are starting to mature and so I'm taking bits of that money putting it into emergency saving pots putting it in a, into a potential car purchase fund for when I need to buy a car which hopefully won't be for another four or five years uh, maybe even more but I want to make sure that I have a pot of money there for that and also topping up the pension i've also got a stocks and shares isa now which i want to keep top up and run in tandem as a retirement fund because it's untaxed and so i've just been putting extra bits of money so when i do my my ins and outs for the universal credit my pension contributions look huge and when you put your contributions in it adds to your expenses so I don't know what I'm going to get from Universal Credit this month because it looks like I haven't earned anything because it's such an enormous amount of money compared to my usual expenses and it's more than I would normally earn because it's coming out of savings. So I'm going to wait and see what happens with that. I will find out about that in a couple of days um, as to what I'm going to get for that because it's, I always... I try and do the calculations so I know in advance, but I can't believe they're going to give me the amount of money that it says that I am short of because it just doesn't make any sense. Anyway, so that's that. I sent a text to a friend today. And the, the reason I know her is because her dad was my neighbour. And it's three years ago today since he died and every year... On the anniversary I send her a, a text just to check in see how they are and just to say god another year's gone already and she texts me back and it's like yeah still miss him so much and all that sort of thing and then a few hours later she called me and I thought well that's a bit weird she must be on a lunch break from work and we chatted for a bit and she said oh it's so nice that you that you remembered because no one else has remembered it's you know it's just us and her dad pops into my thoughts every so often because I live here and he was my neighbor and so he pops in every so often and then she said oh I don't know how to tell you this she said uh, so I've just found out I've got lung cancer and she is not even 60 yet and it turns out that it's quite advanced so she's had no symptoms until I suppose the beginning of the year she had the um, there's, a, there's a bug that's been going around for a while and people get a bit of a cough and it it, it doesn't shift and everyone's had it you know uh, my parents have had it my my brother's had it, the kids have had it. It's like one of those long-term winter bugs because now our systems are a bit more weakened since the pandemic. We're all getting these bugs. And she said, uh, so I thought it was that. And then she said, uh, I was making dinner in the evening and I brought the food through and suddenly I started coughing and I was coughing up blood. She said, it just came out of nowhere. She goes to the gym, she works full-time, la di da di da Anyway, so they went and... She got all the scans done and all this, that and the other and she's got this massive tumour in one lung. And it's so big that it's pressing on her heart apparently. Just awful. And, you know, you hope that when things like, hap like, things like this happen that there are certain things you won't have to worry about, like you'll be protected. 
but you're not. So she goes on sick for work and she's found out she only gets like two weeks of full pay and then she's pretty much cut off. And one of the problems is that when we take up full-time jobs, we often don't look at the small print. And particularly when we're younger and we don't think anything's going to happen to us, we don't look at the fine print of redundancies and what happens if you get too sick to work. So she's now not getting any money from work. and She was there for 16 years. So now she's got to navigate that system. She's too young to take any of her pensions um, because they're quite small pensions, I think, and, and she can't consolidate them yet. She's had it all checked out. So she has now got to think about how, how they're going to survive. Her husband is 70, so I'm presuming he's now retired. Um, she was talking about a charity they discovered um, where you can go and you can go there for the day and they do like spa things and they look after you and they just look after your your mental and physical wellness and help you through things and they have some ladies there who help you deal with finances to try and help you get things ordered and she says um, so I'm now trying to apply for PIP which is just <sighs> We know how awful the system is and we know how difficult the system is to, na to navigate. I mean, I'm partly on the universal credit aspect of it and I'm not in desperate poverty. But I understand how difficult it can be. And um, there are certain podcasts, uh, certain YouTube channels. There's one particular YouTube channel that I follow that is geared for people who are in the the PIP and the disability and the universal credit system and that's really interesting to listen to and of course there are the multitudes of comments that I get when I talk about anything to do with the DWP and universal credit people who are being badly failed by the system especially people who are ill and we've just had that news through that Rishi is going to stop the the sick note culture so stop doctors from giving patients sick notes so that they can get as many people off sick as possible presumably regardless of how sick they actually are and there was something else about how they're going to raise the number of hours and the amount of money you have to earn before you get harassed by your work coach um, I think they're going to try and raise the number of hours work from 15 to 18 and then raise the amount of money so that you have to magic work out of nowhere even more before that you get forced into uh, a, like a having to take whatever they offer you kind of situation. Um, that wouldn't affect me if I was on normal universal credit because I earn more than those limits and work more than those hours but there are lots of people who don't for all sorts of reasons you know you might have caring responsibilities you might have children you might have all sorts of mental and physical challenges which prevent you from working more than 15 hours a week and thus that restricts your amount of money you earn so my friend has now that they're doing the paperwork for her to help her apply for PIP so let's hope she gets it because she's not well I mean she's basically functioning on one lung at the moment um, they've put her on very aggressive chemotherapy for I think four months and then she'll be on radiotherapy for something like I think she said it was going to be two years but they're hoping this thing is going to they've got to see how it behaves the problem is when you're dealing with a cancer diagnosis is Whatever it looks like, you don't know how it's going to react. So already they think that the chemotherapy is having an effect. But this thing is massive, apparently. Um, and it's so scary. And this comes almost to the year, the anniversary, a friend of mine died. The first friend I ever made when I moved up here. She was a cancer survivor, a two times cancer survivor, but all of the 
all the chemotherapy and all the treatment she'd had 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 its effect and eventually she was only working on half a heart because the damage the um, the cancer treatments had had affected other bits of her body long term and she was uh, even younger she was like 56 and so she died last March and it's just oh my goodness and she says I'm not going to let it beat me I'm going to fight it and of course you do you don't give up but she can't really do anything you know she can't she can't drive she can't walk very far because she's out of breath and it's just, uh, and I said to her, look, you just have to take everything day by day. You can only do what you can do. And it's just so depressing. It's like, as you get older, if you've had a relatively calm, safe life like I have, there does come a point where you reach a certain age where people start getting sick and people start dying. And it's, it's... It's that realisation and that reality that, you know, life is more fragile than you realise. And it's perhaps ironic that it's this has come about at a time where, when I'm just about to, or hopefully just about to do this medical study. And I can't remember exactly what it's for, I have all the paperwork, but it's to do with lungs and lung treatments and it's like I don't know my brain's thinking what the what the dickens oh man it's gonna be one of those weeks isn't it sobering thoughts keeps you grounded keeps perspective on things and hopefully helps you to value things a bit more. I've lost my train of thought completely now. <sighs> what a day. Today I'm waiting in for the gas man. One of the things that is quite good about living here is that as well as getting all your repairs done, um, you get your gas and electricity checked every year and certified by a proper gas certified person and an electricity certified person. So today is the turn of the gas. So I'm waiting in all day for him, which doesn't exactly put me out because where else am I going to go? I almost forgot to switch the gas boiler on. has been on since the 7th of January. Uh, it's only good for the central heating when it's really cold. I don't use the gas boiler at all, otherwise um, I don't have hot running water in my flat because it's a waste of money. You have to run the water for so long before it actually comes through hot and then you've wasted all that water as well and I'm on a water meter so that does make a difference. Um, the small amounts of hot water I actually need I just boil in a kettle and then I fill up two flasks and use those throughout the day. So I only make extra water um, for the washing up. It's a small amount of washing up that I do just at the end of the day. I have an electric shower and in the morning to have a wash and whatever I have um, I use what's left in the flasks from the night before because it'll still be warm and it'll give me a nice little little, little facey wash in the morning that's warm so I'm going to go and switch the gas on so that it's ready for him and then he has to come and check the gas meter and then he checks checks for any emissions from the top of the, the boiler and then he runs the water he runs the water to see the hot water come through and I stand there like frozen at the spot so like look at all this water going straight down the sink because it's just such a waste 
we need to do better with how we heat hot water in houses. I had a friend once who uh, they'd had insulated pipes put in so that their water came through almost hot and I know there are those taps that come through hot straight away or something I can't remember anyway so I won't be getting any of those that's for sure so um yeah I've got to sit and, and watch him waste my hot <laughs> waste my water going down the sink uh, and it's amazing how long it takes because he runs the tap really fast and then he waits and you watch and you watch and it's like this takes way too long it's like if you did this every time you wanted hot water out the tap think how expensive your water bill would be So the gas man's been, he came really early actually, he was here before 10 o'clock and then he told me that he could smell gas outside. <laughs> so I'm fine in here. So we had a look around and it seems to be coming from my neighbours underneath to the side of me. So I've called the, um, the gas people and they've come and had a look and they've said their gas meter, which is on the outside of their property, is leaking. So <laughs> he shut off their gas, they're not in today. Uh, he shut off their gas, so they can't. They have no gas now, and uh, he's stuck a note through the door. But I've called the letting agency and asked them to let them know because he's going to come home tonight from work, and they're going to have no gas. Um, it's a really complicated system because you have your gas supplier, which is whoever provides the physical gas. You have. The people who own your meter and you have whoever is uh, supplying you your energy so whoever you pay every month for your direct debit or whatever so the, the problem here is that but, um, it turns out they're on the same energy supplier as me next door and because they're a small supplier the, ga the gas people aren't authorized to make the repairs if it was a big supplier like British Gas or E.ON or EDF or any of those, they'd be able to do it, then they get paid to do it. But because it's a small supplier, they can't touch the equipment. So they've, he's found a, there's like a loose pipe, a loose fitting that's, that's coming away on their gas meter. And it needs to be replaced. So he can't touch it. He's not authorised to touch it. So they've now got to call the supplier and get them to come in and do it. So that'll be down to the neighbours. And at least they have to, because they now have no gas. So it's not like it's something they can ignore and not do. Um, and he's put a tie over the thing so they can't turn the gas back on. Uh, so that's a fun morning. But uh, at least we won't explode, which will be really nice. Um, yeah, so that's that done. Right, so it's, it's now lunchtime, now that we've figured all that out. And I've learned something about gas supplies and how gas works and all sorts of stuff. And I know that... All the gas in my property is safe and well for another year. So I'm now going to go and make lunch because it's now lunchtime. And uh, then this afternoon I'm going to get on and do that zip because I am now free and easy to do what I want. I don't need to keep an eye out for anybody turning up or anything. So that's all good. So lunchtime it is and then let's get on with a zip. Right, here I am. Post Tuesday evening shop and clean. And I have a small Morrison's haul. Uh, nothing massively exciting, but not too bad. Crisps. I know, I'm sorry. £1.49 down to 75p. Discos. I didn't even know they still made discos. Uh, six packs in there. Into the emergency snack bag. I did buy a sandwich like I did last week. Because when I get back from the Wednesday clean... It's after lunch, but I'm hungry because I haven't had anything, and something like this is quick and easy. This is a tuna mayo sandwich. It was £1.50, now 38p. I got asparagus. It was £2.25 for a bunch of asparagus. That's insane. Down to 57p. They're feeling a bit limp, so I'm going to put them in water. And the last thing I got, I'm not sure this was actually a good purchase because I didn't really acknowledge the size of these bags of flour. These were £2.04, down to 51p each. 
but flour is a pretty difficult commodity to get these days. These are self-raising, so these are great for any of the things that I would normally make. Um, generally, if I've only got plain flour, I will just shove some um, baking powder in it. does the same job. These are McDougall's. They are pre-sifted. Um, so those will go into the emergency stores. I have quite a lot of flour in my stores, as you may have seen or will see on my food audit, but most of it is brown flour because um, the bread I make is um, soda bread. It's really quick, it's really simple, minimum ingredients and doesn't take long to bake. It needs no proof, proofing time, no rising time. And that's why I do it. And it's really nice as well. So I don't have much in the way of plain or self-raising. Usually if I want to get self-raising, it's going to be from Sainsbury's and I'll buy it on the nectar points. Um, I can't remember how much it is now for a, a bigger... A, Definitely a bigger bag than this, um, but these will go fine. I can't even tell what the weight is on these. Where is it? Oh, 1.1 kilograms is not too bad. Anyway, so that little lot cost me £2.72, and as usual, I will put the information at the side to say what the shelf price would have been if I paid full price and how much I saved by buying the yellow stickers. And that is it for Tuesday. And that's going to be it for this vlog, I think. The next one that I'm going to make will be tomorrow afternoon. I'm going to do a little walkthrough of the stuff that I'm going to pack to take to the medical unit with me. And then I'm going to do a little bit about um, my whole trip and my stay over. You're not allowed to record in the unit. You're not allowed to talk about in, in detail the study that you're on. So it will be pretty vague, but I will include a few things just to give you a feel for what I'm doing. And then I will talk about how things went generally um, when I get back. I'm only going to be in there for 24 hours and then I'll be home again. So which is nice because it means I don't really have to do anything here at home. I don't have to, like if I was going away for a week or something, I'd clean the flat make sure every single bin was emptied, all the plants would be watered, but I'm literally going for overnight. So I'll just do the basics, like um, anything that I don't want lying around for 24 hours. And then that will be it. So that's the lot. Um, I hope you're having a good week, or you have the good rest of your week. It's uh, quite spring-like today, and hopefully that'll hold up, and I hope it's been kind to you wherever you are, and I will speak to you again soon. So. Have a good week, have a few good few days, and uh, I will speak to you again very, very soon, I don't doubt.